upon a harmonizing of man's inner and outer nature. Here in the West, we have depended, we have, we have developed outwardly a great deal of efficiency. In India, they have concentrated on developing inner efficiency, that is to say, developing the inner intuition, concentrated on uh, the life of attunement with God. It's an interesting thing. In the Bible, Jesus says that you should not live for tomorrow, not worry about what you're going to eat or drink, not take an extra uh, coat, not take any money in your purse. He's really teaching a uh, teaching that is extreme renunciation. And his whole, his whole teaching seems to revolve around that ideal of renunciation. We find that Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says that you should be moderate in your actions. You should, uh, that religion is not for somebody who tries to, uh, who goes without sleep or who doesn't eat enough. That the right religion means doing uh, your duty in this world, fighting the battle of life, and so on. It's so interesting because here we find that the Hindu culture has grown up following in this basic, very important respect, the teachings of Christ. And the Christians have grown up through these last 2,000 years following the teachings of Krishna. And here each is saying the other is a heathen, and yet how much they have gone the opposite way from their own to the other camp. Actually, it is a teaching that the masters in India have, have uh, given that it was the will of God during a time when the human race was going through a dark period, a dark age, that the human race had to specialize. People could not keep a balanced life in, in uh, the way that it's possible today. Even for seeking God, it was considered virtually necessary for a person to renounce the world because to keep his duty to the world, to the family, do his job, and also spend time meditating, it was very, very difficult to do. So the ideal in religion for a long time was, uh, and has been until recent times, to renounce everything, to go off into a monastery, to live in a cave, to have no family ties of any kind. In the Catholic Church, we have found this tradition until the time of the Protestants, but uh, the Catholic Church is the church that has preserved the uh, higher ideals. I say that as a Protestant. I, I have never had the slightest temptation to become a Catholic. I couldn't wait to get out of the Protestant Church, but nonetheless, that's my background. And uh, I think that it's, it's safe to say that it's the, it's the Catholic Church that has emphasized, that has preserved this tradition of communion with God. They have canonized people. The Protestant Church has said, we're all saints already, we read the, read the Bible. And uh, in so doing, they've actually gotten very, they, in this very important respect, they've gotten far from that fundamental teaching of religion, which is that man must commune with God. He can't merely pray to him, believe in him, talk about him. Well, anyway, not to create any kind of conflict that way, the essential thing still is that in the Christian tradition, as it grew up from the earliest times, those who really wanted to give their lives to God were usually people who left the family. Not all. There have been some saintly souls in the family, and there have been certainly some saints in the Protestant churches, even though they haven't been canonized, though the teaching hasn't stressed that idea of communion. Still, it's true that through the tradition of Christianity, it has been largely those people who have said, no, I want to give all my time to God, I want to be a monk or a nun or a priest. And in the, in the Hindu religion and in other religions also, the same teaching has been pretty well observed. And most householders will say, well, someday when I finish my duties, then I'll be able to renounce the world, then I'll be able to seek God. It's an interesting thing, because in the Indian religion, which has come down from very ancient times and was living in, a, in an era also of much greater enlightenment, the early ages, people didn't feel such a need to renounce the world. Many of the greatest saints were married, and uh, the idea of a spiritual marriage uh, 
was a very important ideal. Now we have come to a point where, as our line of gurus has it sort of started, fired the first salvo, you might almost say, in this uh, whole new trend, they, Lahiri Mahashai said that it's, it's uh, he brought to the world, he said it's time for the world to accept that people living a family life can include in their lives the idea of meditation and God communion. They don't, they can keep that balance between the two without feeling that in order to live a spiritual life they have to give everything up. They can spiritualize their own activities because the consciousness of man has become more refined. Well, the same thing, of course, we have believed here in the West and are believing in, a, in an increasing way. And that is why Kriya Yoga is being given here in the West also. There is also this need for the balance between the cultures of the different parts of the world, and particularly those of India and America, for the simple reason that of all the countries in the West, America is the most efficient in material, uh, material ways. Uh, American know-how is a byword throughout the world. And India, of all countries in the Orient, is the most dedicated to the spiritual search. Other parts of the Orient have, uh, they have a spiritual base too. But it's in India where this teaching and where this practice is really a, a it's, it's in the soil. In fact, you, can o you only have to go to India to feel it. I remember, and I've mentioned this in my book, A Visit to Saints of India, how when landing in New Delhi, it was, it was nighttime, and I was with a bunch of Western tourists, no Indians around on the bus, and we came through the darkness on this bus with nothing but Westerners, and so I had no visual or any other kind of sensory stimulation to make me feel I was in India. Even so, I could feel this sense of spiritual freedom and joy as if it were welling up out of the ground. It's a vibration that has been implanted in that soil for thousands of years, and it's just thrilling when you can attune yourself to it and feel it. It's thrilling to feel that spirit there. Well, that spirit, I have, I, I sense vibrations. I sense when I go places what the vibration of a place is. In no place in the world have I felt that kind of power spiritually as I have felt there. Um, this kind of spiritual focus is the, you might say, the pinnacle of all that particular aspect of human endeavor. The time has come to bring these two together also in a balance, a balance between a worldly and a spiritual life. There's a very interesting thing in a book called The Spear of Destiny. I don't know how many of you have read it. I don't know how genuine uh, many of the things in the book are. It's a fascinating book. But one thing really interested me, intrigued me, because it completely corroborated what the tradition of the yogis and what Master told us. According to this, a pope around the middle of the 10th century, his name was Leo something or other, was he received the inspiration from God that the Western, he Western Hemisphere and the Christian religion was intended for a time to specialize because it was not possible to to uh, really become uh, adept if, if uh, it tried to do both things. So it was intended, God willed it, that the church become <coughs> secular, that the church and the whole, Christi a whole Western civilization become focused on becoming really efficient and having a lot of uh, ability in a worldly way, and that the Orient was supposed to specialize in the spiritual side and ignore the physical side, the material side, for a time only. But about a thousand years later, it would be time for these two to come together. Now, this statement was made in a book. Whether it was really uh, uh, something that Pope Leo experienced or not, I've got no way of knowing. All I can say is that history certainly shows us that from that time on, the Christian Church became very secular. From that time on, Christian civilization became very materialistic, and the church itself 
was all more on the line of institutional rather than esoteric religion. A very interesting difference between just around that time and now was a question that was posed in, the, uh, in one of the monasteries in, the, in Christendom, where it was asked if a person in the monastery is in a state of ecstasy, he's been meditating and praying, and he's been lifted up into a state of ecstasy, and then suddenly the bell rings and it's time for him to go about his duties and uh, go to the uh, to go to say the uh, the the divine office together with the other monks what should he do the answer given at that time was he should stay where he is because it would be leaving a higher state for a lower state when the very purpose of this lower state and lower practice is to take you to the higher state so when you are in that leave everything else ignore the monastic discipline and routine now, what makes that question interesting is the fact that it's been posed also in recent times. And the, the question was answered in recent times that, no, you should leave immediately because the most important spiritual thing to do is to follow the discipline of your monastery, to follow the rule of your monastery. You see, this two que these two questions and answers mark the whole change, the whole shift from an inner life to an outward observance. And in the last thousand years, the church has become more, all, all churches have become more and more uh, identified with form, more and more identified with rule, ritual, belief, structure, institution, um, such that you'll get your salvation, people believe now, if you go to church rather than if you, if you have this consciousness within yourself. Well, it's a very interesting point uh, because it does delineate the difference on all levels. It also is interesting that Yogananda said exactly that, that the Western world was supposed to develop in a material way and the Eastern world, particularly India, was supposed by the divine law to preserve this spiritual tradition. Now the time has come, as I said, for us to unite these two. And Yogananda said that someday America and India, particularly these two countries, would unite, not politically, but in working together. And in that unity would lead the world on the path of a balanced outward efficiency and inward dedication. We need these two, and each can help the other. And that age has come when man can bring those two into harmony without starving what little amount of energy he has to give from either. What we need to learn to do, as Yogananda put it, be actively calm and calmly active. In your action, keep the consciousness that you gained in meditation. Don't be, don't be sucked out of that peace. Retain your calmness in the midst of, act of activity, even of the most hectic type. And then when you meditate, meditate with that intensity that action gives you. He said once to Dhyamata that you can never attain the actionless state until you have been intensely active for God. We must act for God. We cannot, and I have seen sometimes people who think, well, I'm going to, I'm going to spend, I'm going to advance only through meditation. But I have not seen, unless they were ready for that, I have not seen them advance, really. I've seen them becoming more selfish, more in, ingrown, more... Uh, there isn't that kind of, of blossoming consciousness that comes as we grow spiritually. On the other hand, of course, the opposite is true, too, that when I've, I've seen a lot of people on the spiritual path who only work, and they gain a certain amount also, but they, they, don't, they lack, they starve spiritually for that balance. To bring the two together means to be able to give energy to your meditation, to, be give, to give calmness to your work. And what we need to do, and I believe that our group here at Ananda is in the vanguard of a very great movement that is going to, it's sort of a groundswell now, but I feel it's going to really become the molding force of our civilization in the years ahead where people are going to finally give up 
in disgust this present day preoccupation with cynicism with uh, n absolute loss of any kinds of values and purpose in life this belief that there is no higher destiny no higher purpose no meaning that the only thing that man should live for is himself as an individual and that all values ha are purely what we find to be conducive to our own personal and selfish happiness I think people are becoming fed up with this kind of doctrine fed up or maybe just exhausted with it because it's an exhausting doctrine to keep up a delusion for any length of time becomes more and more tiring and more takes more and more out of us I, I've made this comparison here before and I think it's really quite amusing to contemplate the the transition in popular music from say a hundred years ago till today if you look at the waltzes that were essentially they were peppy and happy but f harmonious and joyful uh, gradually into the slightly jagged rhythms of around 1915 and then the slightly more tension the uh, slightly greater tension that you get in 1920s up to the big band movement with that big heavy ego emphasis and finally as we come up through rock and roll into punk rock and God knows what else um, <laughs> disco beat it's not only mindless it's totally lower chakra energy um, it, 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 there's so much of this this uh, tension being built up in that kind of, of heavy rhythm and heavy beat that I don't see where else we can go from that except uh, perhaps to be popped out of our skins <laughs> um, that tension builds up and builds up and builds up and finally you get books on the primal scream and so on um, I went to my first and forgive me Ram Prashad if you ever hear a tape of this talk last rock concert um, <laughs> <laughs> Probably. It's really lovely to see Ram Prashad. He's our member and he's uh, the lead guitarist and singer in what has become the number one rock group in the world, uh, Supertramp. It's lovely to watch him, I have to say that, because he's so calm and so completely unattached to the whole thing and so centered in himself. It's absolutely an anomaly. Um, there he is, centered in himself and all this bedlam going on. <laughs> but. Uh, in addition to the bedlam, I mean the sound, I admit I didn't hear it under the best of circumstances because the acoustics were terrible and so what they do when the acoustics are terrible is turn the volume up even higher. <laughs> the concrete floor was rocking, but louder than the band was the crowd. Everybody shrieking his head off. I, I just don't see where else we can go except madness. World War, yes. <laughs> some kind of outward chaos, some kind of outward absolute disruption. It seems to me that there's no other way to go except that, and then finally exhaustion. All right, now what do we do? I think we're heading in that direction, that we're just getting more and more tense, and finally there's something inside us that's pulling back, and that's what I see in groups like you all. Groups uh, that are trying, even the super tramp, even super tramp, even though they are strongly into rock music, at least they're trying to bring some kind of ideas into it. It's not totally mindless. It was the audience rather than the than the lyrics that were mindless. But uh, there is some kind of ideal. There's some kind of wish. There's this hunger at the heart of many people today to to get some kind of meaning again. I think we're we're really fed up with this civilization. Uh, as it as it stands we naturally like our cars and TV and airplanes and these are all very convenient things but we're fed up with the cynicism that's being touted so strongly today where no movie you go to I went I, I thought well I'd like to go out to a movie last Sunday so Seva and I went out to see Capricorn one if you haven't seen it you're better off um, the, it's so incredible, the total cynicism where they even uh, talk about idealism and our need for idealism as the, on, uh, as the entree to a, an absolute destruction of that, need, of that idealism too. This total uh, belief that there's nothing good in anything or anybody and even the talk of this is just whitewashed, that, that really 
There's so much evil everywhere, and we might as well accept it that that's, that's what life is like. I think there are a lot of us who don't feel that that's so. We know in our hearts that there is goodness. There is this groundswell of need for truth, of need for, for honor and loyalty. I, uh, just in, in things in politics, I get so, I feel so ashamed of my country when I see it turning away from a friendly country like Taiwan and going to China. We could, if we had to go to China, at least say that this is a condition on which we'll do it. We won't renounce our friends. But we're losing, even on a political scene, we're losing people's faith because they see that we're so cynical that we're willing to go with whatever uh, the wind happens to be blowing, whatever wind happens to be blowing at the time. And that's only one example. It's so prevalent. I just, I think, I love this country. I have such faith in its, its potential and its goodness. But when it does things like that, I think, I wish we could clear out all those people who pretend to act on our behalf and try again. Because I know what goodness there is here. I've, I've been all over the world many times. I've traveled so much. And I've seen great goodness in this country. Other people call us so materialistic and so on. But what country could be invaded by another country, attacked by another country, and after winning the war, do everything it can to lift that country up? There's lots of good karma in America, too. And I'd, I'd like to think, and I do think, that, it's, it, that the real heart of America is not what you find in most books, not what you find in the newspapers, in the media, but I have seen it in the streets, I have seen it in the churches, I've seen it on buses, I've seen it everywhere, a great deal of goodness, a great deal of belief in man's potential. And this, I think, is going to win because this is based on a reality, the other is based on a delusion. I think that after whatever, whatever chaos we're going to go through because of our stupidity, I think that we're coming out of that trouble, coming out of that baptism by fire, and that we are going to see an age where man is going to affirm on a higher level than ever before that we are divine, that we do come from some kind of higher regions, that we do have some kind of higher destiny, and that it is possible to live in tune with that destiny. Master said an interesting thing. He said that because it is the divine will now for these two countries particularly, and for more generally the West and East to begin to work together, but he said these two countries are going to be in the vanguard of that. He said many Hindu souls are being born in the West, in America especially, and many American souls are being born in India. And it's so interesting to see, you see many of the faces here, they just look like Indians with white skin. There's just something about them that, that as soon, I know, as soon as I came upon some of the teachings of India in that little book, A Short World Bible, I knew I was home. It wasn't talking about Brahma and Vishnu and all these gods and goddesses. If it had, I wouldn't be home. I'm sure I'd have left it way behind me. But it was talking about these cosmic principles that are so... Uh, uh, Emerson said that I think it was Emerson who said that just reading the Upanishads is, is it, it expands the mind. It makes you aware of the, the vastness of things, the vastness of reality. Even reading that higher philosophy, the Vedanta philosophy, is inspiring. What to speak of experiencing what it talks about. And then when I travel in India and I look at these men in business suits, I, I realize that many of them are, are, they just look like stockbrokers or IBM executives or something with dark skin. And it's so interesting, and they talk that way. They're not at all, they haven't any interest in the Indian religion. They just want what America has. And uh, when Americans come, they just rush over and want to talk to them. But it's because they have that deep samskar, that deep tendency in them from past lives that makes them in tune with that. Well, God is doing that in order to help bring about this balance between the two. I think that one of the most important things going on in the world today is what we're doing right here at Ananda. Bringing people to a sense of their own worth inwardly and spiritually, not thinking only in terms of our outward relationships and our, our need to make it on a material level, but to learn 
the beauty and dignity of cooperation. Learning the, see, uh, this song, Go On Alone, it's really, in a very real sense, it's our theme song here at Ananda. I used to worry, starting Ananda, I'm such an individualist. I'm really, in many ways, a loner. And it seemed to me sort of absurd for somebody who likes to be alone, who doesn't like to be sort of with the crowd, doing what the crowd's doing and getting out there and uh, working with people all the time. I like to sort of withdraw to my room, shut the door, put an in seclusion sign on it and write books. Well, what business did I have starting a community? I used to visit other places where I'd see the the uh, leaders of these communities are, are such team workers and they love to get committees together. Every time any questions raised, they call for a committee and they sit around and sort of kick it back and forth and chew the fat and uh, uh, come up with some kind of an answer. Well, my answers don't come that way. I'm lousy in a committee. I can only work from within. And I used to think, well, these are the kinds of people who ought to be starting communities. What am I doing? And yet I knew that I had to do it. I had felt that guidance from the age of 14 or 15. And what was I doing starting a community in that way? Naturally, you, you attract your own. And so what I did was attract a, a community of eccentrics, <laughs> a community of people who didn't want to just go with the crowd, a community of people who wanted to stand on their own feet and find their answers according to the way they felt. And it's, it's lovely to see how many opinions can come up, people can come up with here, and yet there is that other aspect to it, and that is that we all want not just what our opinion is or what our desires are, but what is true. We were, uh, Hori Priya and I were talking about how stubborn Taureans are. She has a lot of Taurian friends that are stubborn, and I'm a Taurian and I'm stubborn. But I said that the way out of that stubbornness that I've found is to be loyal to truth, not to my opinion. So that if I find that something I've felt is wrong, I can drop it in a second because I'm stubborn, but I'm stubborn in wanting to do what is right and not just do what, what uh, I'm wrong. Mainly, it's, it's a, a point I've come to after many years of hard knocks. I discovered that when I hung on to my opinion, because it was wrong, if it was wrong, if it was wrong, then because it was wrong, it ended up falling flat on its face anyway. So I thought, well, if I'm going to uh, have to give it up sooner or later, I might as well give it up right away and not waste all that time. Because the only thing that wins in the last uh, is truth, not opinion. So I've learned that it's good to be stubborn, yes, but stubborn to truth. Cling to what is right and don't be concerned with anybody's mere opinions. Well, that's the attitude that we have here, which is why when everything has finally been worked out and people have made their, uh, expressed their thoughts and so on, we're willing to go, all of us are willing to go in a single direction because we figure that what's right for everybody, what's best for everybody is I'll do, that, that's fine. So we have this lovely balance and what I've seen as we've grown in the, over the years is that we are far more harmonious than these people who try from the outside to achieve that harmony, who are always sort of trying to get it by. I was so amused in Virginia recently, somebody posed a question. He said, what do you do when you have arguments and fights and uh, things like this in the community? And <coughs> Peter Caddy, who is the founder of Findhorn, um, there are probably three communities in the world that are really well known. Ananda's one of them, certainly. F the farm is certainly another, and Findhorn is another. I'd say those are probably the three best-known communities. And uh, somebody asked Peter Caddy this question, and he talked about all these, these uh, well, they have a committee to handle that kind of thing. Then they've got another committee that those people can appeal to, and finally a committee at the top that can resolve all differences between these various committees. And uh, it sounded very efficient. I was most impressed. And I was also very relieved that they didn't ask me that question because <laughs> it would have been, it would have sounded silly in a way to say, well, we don't have that kind of problem. Of course you're supposed to have that kind of problem. When you've got people together, they're supposed to fight. We had, a, we had an FBI agent came up here, uh, come up here a few years ago and he was showing me some pictures saying, are these people staying here? <laughs> and uh, I, I said, well, um, 
first I'd like to know what you want them for, because if they're trying to avoid the Vietnam War, I, I personally would avoid it too, so I'm not going to tell you. I don't believe in that war. So he said, no, these people have been killing people and blowing up bridges and so on. And I said, well, in that case, that kind of person isn't likely to come here, and if he did, he wouldn't stay. It would get him down too fast to find people so harmonious. And he says, you mean you don't have any fights here? And I said, no, we really don't. Uh, he couldn't believe me. He said, listen, that world out there is a jungle. He'd, he'd, he'd come up from Los Angeles. So then, anyway, he couldn't believe it. So he went and talked to somebody else and sort of took her aside and said, listen, <laughs> about this here fighting that you have in the community. <laughs> well, she, got, she gave him the same story, and he just shook his head. He couldn't understand it. But the truth is that when you, when you gain a certain peace in yourself and when you gain your strength in yourself, this is, this is what we've got to learn in society, that the answers are not going to come from a large group of people doing it, but from individuals reaching that level of integrity within themselves where they can work with goodwill with one another. You, you find that you can work with one another and not against one another when you have your own centeredness in yourself. But if you don't have that center, then in order to affirm your own integrity, you may find yourself fighting with others or strongly arguing or disagreeing. You don't have to do it if you've got that center there. You know that, that uh, whatever other people say and whatever other people do, you have that strength in yourself. At that same conference in Virginia, there was a panel discussion, this, the same discussion, in fact, and each person from different communities was requested to stand up and talk about what, how he saw uh, the New Age in the light of communities and cooperation, how he saw these things happening. And everybody got up. I was the last one in the line. And everybody got up and, start and talked about cooperation this and cooperation that. And uh, I thought, well, I can't say the, the same thing. There's no point in just uh, repeating what's been said. And so I thought there's one thing that hasn't been said that's very important and that we feel vitally important at Ananda, but I was afraid that I'd absolutely blow it as far as that conference went if I talked about it. Nevertheless, I, I felt that I'm not... I don't really care what people think. I was quite aware that very possibly everybody in that hall would be upset with me, and certainly all my fellow speakers would be upset with me. Because I got up and I said that, you know, I don't really think that cooperation is all that important until we learn to cooperate with truth. To cooperate with one another without bringing in that dimension of truth is to do what humanity has done again and again, walk in lockstep togetherness toward a cliff. Think of the time of the Nazis. Think of the times of great persecution. People were cooperating with one another. That's not good enough. We have to individually feel what the truth is. And if we have to stand against the whole, the whole human race, if we know what is right inside, we have to go according to that until we see differently. The time may come when we do see differently. Then we have to be willing to say, okay, now I see I was wrong. Then I can change. But until we see it, we have to go by what we see. It's a dangerous philosophy because you can't guarantee that everybody's going to see things in the right way, even in a true way. You get a lot more confusion for a while. But after the confusion dies down, I find that people basically really do know what is true. They do know, for example, that goodness is better than badness. Nobody could, make, could get a, a, much of a following if he came up and stood before... Uh, the, uh, stood on the platforms of the world in the churches and elsewhere and declared that my children for a change let's be dishonest let's be untruthful there's just something inside us we don't have to be told that it's better to be truthful it's better to be kind it's better to be loving it's better to cooperate in a good cause but not in a bad cause we know these things we don't have to tell people that I think that we sell people short when we think that they have to be governed all the time but in every field, in every phase of life. One of the things that makes the religion of India so vital is that they have absolutely no organization. 
They don't have a pope. They don't have a hierarchy. They don't have a lot of, ca uh, of cardinals and bishops telling them what they ought to believe. They pretty well leave it up to individuals to be as stupid as they choose or as intelligent as they choose. And by and large, it pretty well evens out where you've got the saints sifted out and looked up to by everybody. It works. It doesn't seem to work. You'd, you don't have a system that guarantees anything. You simply have the basic fact that all of us are children of God, and on some level, all of us know it. We may not admit it outwardly, but we all know there isn't even the worst criminal is not going to say, I am evil. At some, in some way or another, he's going to, going to try to make a case for the belief that he's good. Dillinger, when he died, was, a, a note was found by his body saying that I've been much misunderstood, that within this body there beats a very loving heart. Here he was public enemy number one, killed, I don't know how many people, finally died in a shootout, and still he could say that. We all have this understanding inside ourselves, and if we'll give people that chance to grow, I think we'll find it. Well, I was grateful that after talking really quite strongly on this point, that Peter Caddy said, I'm so glad you said that, because that's really exactly what's needed. And others said this too. Um, the, the emphasis on cooperation in cooperative communities needs to be balanced by exactly what we have here. Uh, not eccentrics in, in a bizarre way. I, I think anybody who came for the first time yesterday might think, yes, that too. <laughs> but rather eccentric in the sense of being willing to be centered in yourself rather than outside, which is not eccentric, but truly centric. Eccentric means off-center, doesn't it? But we mean off-center as far as committee decisions go, truly centered in yourself. And then to have that center, to realize that whatever good I can do must come from that center, and then to realize further that other people too have that center, to respect that center in them. A community like ours has grown on the ideal not of individualism, but of individuality. Individu individualism becomes almost a new cult, an emphasis on I versus you. But individuality means to try to find who I really am, what I really am, and then respect that in others. This quality of respect is something that people feel from Ananda. Wherever we went on our tour across the country, two tours and several visits in many areas, people again and again were so touched, even moved to the point of tears, to see that kind of goodness, that kind of integrity, that kind of respect that gave other people their space, that didn't try to put over anything on them because they had that kind of respect for the God in those people to let them be what they were. It wasn't as if, well, uh, we're doing a better thing and you're doing something worldly and materialistic. No, if other people choose to be materialistic, they'll learn at their, peer, at their time, in their own rhythm. Meanwhile, they too are children of God and rather see that level in them rather than their temporary delusions. That's the kind of respect I mean, not to respect people for their ignorance. Respect them for the fact that they too, as much as any master who ever lived, are children of the same God. When you see that in people, then they begin to get that faith in, in that quality in themselves. So where I used to worry about who was I to start a community, I've been very gratified to see that it does work. I noticed this at Mount Washington when I lived there. There was a period of time when we decided that we were too much into our own meditations and not really... Uh, communing, communicating enough with each other, and what we needed was to have more group things. And so what we did was we'd, oh, listen to symphony programs together, we'd go on picnics together, we'd go on little outings and so on. And we found that where it was, whereas it was fun, it didn't seem to really bring us closer together. Then we tried a radically opposite thing. We all went into silence. Nobody spoke to anybody for a week. We spent a lot of meditation, time in meditation. Do you know in that week we came so close together? It was like when Anandamoy and I stayed out to, together in the desert for a week or two. And we, came, we became so close to one another that we knew each other's thoughts. That he had only to think something and I'd say it, or I had only to think something and he'd say it. It's a sadness in my life that we've grown far apart now. 
because of my not being in the work. But we were very close at one time, very dear to one another. I think he was in many ways the best friend I've ever had. It makes it painful to me to find that now he he really talks against me because I'm doing a work that isn't official. I wrote him a letter a few months ago and I said, you know, you bless me every time you talk against me because you help me to affirm that my love for you is unconditional. But he's continuing to bless me. <laughs> it's too bad. Nonetheless, it's true that there was a time when we were very, very close, and that closeness came in silence. It didn't come in chewing the fat. And this is the kind of closeness we have. We d we're not a commune. I think of communes as everybody living together in one bed. It often is that. <laughs> but uh, here we emphasize the ideal of individuality, of privacy. Of We give people their own space. We want them to have their own homes or at least their own rooms. We believe what Yogananda said, that... that, you, that uh, you, he said, remember, you can never, never, never find God unless you spend more time by yourself. One beautiful teaching is to live here as though only you and God lived here. It's a beautiful thing to see how close people come together when, they're, when they touch on that level. And that's why there's such harmony here. Yes, there are hurt feelings, there, there are disagreements and so on, but we seem somehow to work, them out, work these things out harmoniously because of this inner attunement that we have. I see now that the best way that we can really help other communities to get founded is to help them to see that ultimately it begins right here with me. We don't get strength if we only live in an outward kind of communion. That outward communion is a natural part and a fulfilling part of human life. I don't mean to discount the beauty of being together on those levels, too. Certainly it's beautiful. But if it doesn't start from within, if it doesn't start in silence, like that song of mine, without silence, what is song? Without night, where is dawn? Were it not for men's woes, who would smile at a rose? We need to understand that the, the beauty of, so of music, the beauty of sound, and the beauty of human relations must begin with this integrity in a, inside ourselves, each man recognizing that communion within himself with God and with his higher self. And when we have that communion, I've seen the saints, Ananda Moima, Master, other great saints, they are so dear to everybody who meets them. They can't help feeling when they come in the presence of these people as if they were meeting their best friend that they'd ever had. Because those people are meeting them on that level, which is what we all want too, because all of us want joy, all of us want love, all of us want wisdom, all of us want light. And when we have that, when we have that understanding that it comes from that higher self and not from the lower self, then we can bring that higher consciousness down into all the normal activities of life and sanctify them too, so that everything becomes more beautiful. Everything, even business, can become a joy and not just money grubbing. Business can be a beautiful thing when you see it in this way and you see that it's really intended to serve people, to help them to get what they need, and to be an opportunity to meet people and talk with them in a friendly and loving and joyful way. Everything can be sanctified and everything can be made beautiful when it comes from the inner self and from attunement with the higher self within. <laughs>